It's the last place you'd expect to see them. But the Australian outback is home to the largest herd of wild camels in the world. From just several thousand brought to Australia in the mid-1800s, they now number over a million. It's a remarkable story of outback survival. The men who brought them here, the Afghan and Indian cameleers, brought not just their know-how to the bush, but their culture and their religion. They were tough. I think they were resilient and maybe a little bit crazy. They probably gave Australia the lifeline to the outback. They just came here with a job to do and they just went off and they did it. Last of the lords of the desert, who carried out food and water on a string of 50 camels. Old Bijar de Verish, the giant Afghan, who fought the desert by compass and by Koran. mosque was built here, you know that. The first mosque in Australia was built here in Maree. In the 1890s, during the height of the camel industry, Maree in South Australia was known as Little Asia for its many turbaned inhabitants. Today, only a handful of camelier descendants remain in the town. An echo of that era occurs once a year during the Maree Camel Cup when the town's population swells and descendants come from all over Australia to gather in the old Garn town. They back a winner and enjoy a barbecue, keeping up their family traditions of spicy curries and chapati bread. It's fantastic. I mean, look at everybody here now. You know, everybody loves to get together and enjoy each other's company and cook a curry. These Camellia families are now part of Australia's bush heritage. But their story begins more than 150 years ago when their Muslim forefathers arrived to this totally foreign place, not knowing just what Australia had in store for them. In the early 1800s, European settlers continued their quest to penetrate into the remote heart of Australia. Camels were suggested as a possible solution, and in 1839, the first camels were imported to Australia, but they did not survive for long. Five camels were imported into Australia from Tenerife, and the, remainder, the remaining one that was alive was bought by John Ainsworth Horrocks, and he decided he was going to explore out to the north and northwest of the known settled districts of South Australia. So he had this camel called Harry that was a curiosity and nothing else. It was the only camel in Australia at the time. In the expedition to the western side of the Flinders Ranges, as they're heading along, Harry accidentally discharged a loaded gun that belonged to Horrocks. I was reloading my gun to shoot a bird for the natural history collection, and it discharged when my camel, Harry, lurched. This movement fired the gun, shooting the ramrod through my fingers and lower jaw. John Ainsworth Horrocks. After this tragic incident involving Australia's first camel, it was another 15 years before the Victorian government imported 24 camels, arriving in Port Melbourne on the 13th of June, 1860. The camels were used on the doomed Burke and Wills expedition. Riding on the camels is much more pleasant than I anticipated, and for my work, I find it much better than riding on horseback. The animals are very quiet, and easily managed, much more so than horses. William Wills. Burke had horses, he would have had to go much more slowly, much more cautiously, much more reliant on the water that he finds along the way. He couldn't have expected to do it in three months, but camels allowed him to go the distance. Three Muslim cameleers were also brought out to care for the camels during the expedition. Dost Mohammed, the lead cameleer, 
was bitten by a powerful bull camel and died. He's buried close to the expedition base camp, at the spot where he prayed each morning. Many influential colonists closely followed the Burke and Wills expedition. Pastoralist and entrepreneur Thomas Elder knew just how reliable and resilient the animals were. In 1866, he imported 121 camels and 31 cameleers to establish his transport and camel breeding business. Thomas Elder and his to be brother-in-law, Robert Bar Smith, came from Scotland and bought a lot of pastoral leases and realised that the only way to keep transport going when there were droughts on was to have camels. In 2011, the city of Port Augusta in South Australia commemorated the landing with the unveiling of a plaque on the spot where the 31 men first unloaded their camels. But let us spare a thought today of the men and the animals <laughs> crammed together on a vessel which made the perilously long voyage from Karachi. They left behind them their families and homes, many never ever to see them again. The Afghan cameleers and their ships of the desert were a turning point in the development of the Australian interior. Camel trains brought urgently needed supplies to outback communities. They carted materials to build the overland telegraph. They assisted miners during the West Australian gold rush and were invaluable during expeditions into uncharted territory. It was very clear that the Afghans would provide a solution, or certainly camels would, would provide a solution to the opening up of the interior. Everything was done by hand and uh, they'd have a box there to help the big boxes up onto the side of the camels and um, I think uh, their life was a, a pretty uh, strenuous one and um, I don't, don't think any other whites would have wanted to do it. Camel strings was the worst job as every morning the camels were loaded and in the evening, sometimes midnight, offloaded. No sooner were we in bed, we would rise and after the camels we would go. Jack Bija. As the numbers of cameleers increased, to as many as 4,000 in Australia, communities sprang up in outback towns like Farina, Udnadatta, Broken Hill, and important satellite towns like Maree. The cameleers' presence in Maree is very important because it was where they established their own autonomous existence and it became the headquarters for operations all, all through uh, South Australia. Living in Maree, we had the white people on one side of the railway line, we had the Afghans on the other side and the Aboriginal people living right down further. The reason they lived on one side of the town was that Maori itself was a railway town, so there was the hotel and the shops on one side and what became the Afghan town on the other. They also wanted to be closer to the Mari Springs that were northeast of the town, closer to where the racecourse is now. One of Mari's legendary figures was a cameleer, Beja Dervish, who had served in the British Army and arrived in Australia around 1890 to work as a cameleer. Good day, Beja. Hello, Tom Cruise. Two battlers of the Birdsville Trek. Tom Cruise, who goes out today in a truck, and Bija, last of the lords of the desert, who carried out food and water on a string of 50 camels. Old Bija de Burish, the giant Afghan, who fought the desert by compass and by Koran. They would pray five times a day. They would carry their prayer mats with them when they used to go um, uh, travel from one state to another. They had a very strong Muslim identity. When they go along with their camels and the strings, and they'd get down there at their time for praying, they'd lay all the camels down, get their prayer mat out, and they'd pray. When they finished, they put their prayer mat back on the camel and they walk again. They never rode, they walked. Around the house, he wore the usual um, 
bloomers and jacket and the, the turban, but when he went out, he was always dressed with a, a jacket on and trousers and looked very smart. I was only seven years old when Grandad died uh, in 1957. He was just a leader of men. He was a really big man. He was very well respected. He was probably the respected leader in the Maori community and a lot of, for a lot of the Afghans. And... Said to be over 100 years old when he died in 1957, Bijar was immortalised in Douglas Stewart's iconic poem, The Afghan. Mopping his coppery forehead under his turban, old Bijar in baggy trousers, bearded, immense. Old oh, camel driver, explorer, the giant Afghan who steered his life by compass and by Koran. Oh, yeah, believe in God, young man, no care. God save, God help. Oh, yeah, need help out there. He whirled in desert still, too wild for human. Cameleers like Bija came from the arid hills and plains of Afghanistan and India. In Australia, these diverse ethnic groups of Pashtuns, Punjabis, Baluchis and Sindhis were collectively called Afghans. Most found a common bond in their Muslim identity. And where they settled, they built mosques. Built in 1890, Broken Hill has the oldest mosque in New South Wales. One of its founders, Zaydullah Fazala, was the last cameleer to pray here. My granddad used to be here all the time. He was always locked up. But after he died, no one came here. And uh, vandals got in here, kids got in here and playing in here. And inside the prayer room, it's pretty well much all original. Well, from what I can gather, there's one old fellow used to, when it was prayer time, he, he'd get out and he'd put his hands up like that and he'd yell out something, and they'd all come walking down to the mosque. The Adelaide Mosque, established in 1889, is the oldest mosque still in use in Australia. This is a get-together place for all Afghans in Australia. At least they try to be here once in a year, particularly Eid time, here. Throughout Australia, who are working in Western Australia, Queensland, Central Australia, Northern Territory, it does not matter. They try to come here at least during the Eid time. Most Cameleers eventually return to their tribal homelands. A minority stayed and sought wives in Australia. But it wasn't easy. Pop actually met a lady in Maree who came there with seven children and was left there and nobody really wanted her. Her name was Amelia Shaw. For a white woman to marry an Afghan, uh, they actually went into their homes and lived the life of what would have been a Muslim woman's life without wearing the veil, you might say. They stayed indoors. They could only go outdoors if they were chaperoned. All the children were brought up uh, learning the Quran, the girls as well. It probably was hard because they weren't, they didn't mix in with the Anglo people, like the white communities, and they had to try and mix in with the Aboriginal um, community. So it would have been hard because they were a different race of people. The Cameleers travelled up and down the camel pads, delivering goods to remote outback towns. One Cameleer met a young Aboriginal girl named Lally. They fell in love and were determined to wed. They called him Jack. Jack Akbar, yeah. Very gentle person. Um, yeah, very strict in his way, you know, in his religion. Yeah. Hard working, yeah. honest. From what we gather, he came with his father, who had already come out here to work with the, uh, on the gold fields with camels. Um, he brought his son with him, um, and then his father died, so Jack had to make a living, and he multiplied his jobs. He, worked, he took the government mail. He did do some carting and hawking, and, uh, and then he worked uh, with other camel men. My father wanted to marry my mother, uh, which was not allowed because he was Asiatic, and they could not marry another coloured race of person. 
I fell in love with Jack. He was good and kind and he wanted to marry me. We went to the police for permission to wed, but they didn't give it. Lally Akbar. I think my mum and dad were both a very strong willed. And daddy was highly principled and he believed that what he was doing, when he believed that what he was doing was the right thing to do, there was no way you could stop him. He would fight tooth and nail, as they say, to, to get justice. When I ran away from the Moore River settlement, I went on foot for hundreds of miles searching for Jack. When we arrived in Adelaide, we were married at the registry office. We got together a little home and we were so happy until the police arrested us and took us back to West Australia. After all the years of trouble, there were a few years of court cases and um, he, won the, he won all the cases in the end and um, the, um, whoever the people were, the top law people said, uh, they exiled them out of Western Australia. Don't ever come back. Jack and Lally moved to South Australia, where they lived a quiet life, bringing up their four children. For the next generation of Afghans and Indians, holding on to their Islamic faith would be very difficult. When my father came home and he'd go into the big room to pray, we weren't allowed to go in there. He had his own little Afghan beliefs. Dad painted everything green. <laughs> We had a green clock, we had a green stove, we had green walls, we had green fences. <laughs> but that must have been his way of acknowledging his father's country of birth. I still class myself as a Muslim. Still like to be buried the way they do, because it's a good way to be buried. It's a tradition, it's been going on for years. Although I don't know the prayers or anything, it's still my family that's there. And that's why I, I want to be buried there. The Camellias faced many challenges. One of the greatest was being forced onto the fringes of society by a community who perceived them as a threat particularly the horse and bullock teamsters, who resented the Camellias as they became increasingly in demand. Now, when the Afghans came, they, they charged very low freight rates, they walked the whole way, they got through when there was floods or drought, and so the teamsters were very angry towards the Afghans. The editor of the Coolgardie Miner, an Englishman named Frederick Vosper, who was instrumental in the establishment of the anti-Afghan league, continued to demonise the Afghan way of life through his editorials. We fear a low, degenerate, mongrel race of human beings will follow where they lead. And for the protection of our Anglo-Saxon race, we say emphatically, Hushta, which means lay down, we have no use for you at present. Frederick Vosper. The term Afghan began to embody contempt, racial inferiority, uncleanliness, brutality, strangeness and fear in a white Australia. During this period of heated public debate about the place of the Afghan in society, rumours emerged that cameleers and their camels were polluting the waterholes vital to the survival of both European and Afghan communities. Afghan camel drivers frequently take forcible possession of the whales in remote parts of West Australia, and that they are in the habit of polluting the waterholes by washing their clothes and persons therein. Hugh Mann, member for Kulgadi. Tensions were high, and it didn't take much at all to, to um, sort of light the, the fuse for conflict. A dramatic confrontation between a teamster named Thomas Knowles and Kamalia Noor Mohammed further fueled anti-Afghan sentiments on the West Australian goldfields. Knowles alleged the Afghan was polluting the waterhole and believed that he was in his right to challenge him and shot the Afghan. He claimed in self-defence. After considerable pressure from the anti-Afghan league, the District Court of Albany charged Knowles with manslaughter instead of murder. The jury took just one hour to acquit Knowles to loud applause from the courtroom. 
He walked out a free man and a hero. Thomas Knowles got off scot-free. Not even manslaughter, not even grievous bodily harm. He got away with it. The shooting at Afghan Rock, the incident itself, and the trial of Thomas Knowles is a microcosm of how society viewed the Afghans and the hawkers of the period. After Federation in 1901, Afghans were subject to more stringent immigration policies. The new federal parliament passed the Immigration Restriction Act, which severed non-European migration to Australia. I don't know if they thought they would find themselves living on the edge of society because this was the, the rampant age of the white Australia policy and it was race that decided whether Australia would open its door to you or slam it in your face. Prominent Broken Hill Camellia Khan Zeda applied five times to become naturalised. I regret to have to inform you that it is not the policy to issue certificates of naturalisation to Asiatics. Therefore, there is no possibility of your client's application being granted. F.J. Quinlan, Canberra. The Camellias, many of them were illiterate men, and of course they encountered prejudice, they encountered discrimination. They were never allowed to be naturalised Australians, no matter how long they stayed here. They were not permitted to bring their wives or, or their sons or brothers with them because they were never meant to stay. Soon, moves were made to shut down the Muslim Camellia business altogether. In 1902, a law was passed to prevent the free movement of Camellia teams around the country and Afghans had to apply for a special license to operate and had to pay taxes for their camels. On the surface, it looks like uh, the scales of justice were a little weighted against the, the Afghans. I, I think one could say that. But essentially, the, the demand for camels was, was lessening. The critical factor that, that led to the shutdown of the camel industry was the arrival of the motor truck. By 1929, most of the cameleers were out of work and the camel trade was all but dead. In South Australia, the government passed the Camel Destruction Act. But these men loved their animals and refused to shoot them, instead releasing them into the desert. Many of them knew the individual names of those camels. Camels were no longer required. And because of that, look how many feral camels there are now. Aishi Zayda was the last of the descendants who lived amongst the Cameliers. She died recently, aged 102. Good working man, that's all I remember. Going, working up and down birds and track. That's all he'd done, because I was getting up too old for work. It's a pretty amazing story. Hard yakka, you know, hard work. But, you know, they did it. And a lot of people tried to do what they did. They were tough. I think they were resilient. They were ambitious, brave, and maybe a little bit crazy. Just sorry I didn't ask them about their heritage and that, you know, what they'd done and where they worked. And it must have been hard. They probably gave Australia the lifeline to the outback. And without them, I don't know who would have opened the outback up. When I even think about my grandfather and my father, I said, I'm only a short person, but I'll stand 10 feet tall because I have that pride. I'm a Muhammad and I'm proud of it. 
And I don't care who knows it. I've been born with something that's special. And that's where it is with the other Afghan descendants. We're special. We've got something that nobody else can lay claim to.